So about a year and a half ago, I got a phone call from a professor in Calgary at Ambrose University, and this professor was saying, look, we're doing a study of the 30,000 churches across Canada, and what we're trying to do is we're starting an institute called the Flourishing Church Institute, and we're trying to figure out what causes a church to flourish and what's, what's happening in a church when it's not flourishing. Uh, could we come and interview you about what's going on at Riverwood as one of the churches across Canada? I said, sure, come on. And so uh, we met together in the, in the uh, Grounded Cafe, and uh, I was introduced that day to a young professor with an earring, pretty hip, hip professor, and an old guy with silver hair. And, uh, and, and I thought, you know, I'm probably going to be really drawn to the young guy with the earring, but I wasn't. I was super drawn to the old guy with silver hair because there was something about this guy that just spoke fatherly wisdom. And I thought, my thought was, I got to get this guy to come to Riverwood because we need some of what he has in his understanding of Scripture to minister to us. So a year and a half later, uh, we, today, this weekend, we flew uh, Dr. Bill McAlpine in from Calgary, and I said, would you just come and minister the Word of God to us? So uh, for those of you at the warehouse, at the fire hall, up in Churchill, wherever you are online and here at the factory, would you please give a very warm R Riverwood welcome to Dr. Bill. <laughs> Thank you, Todd, I think. <laughs> See, in the first two services, I was the older guy. Now I'm the old guy. <laughs> Boy, aging is rapidly happening. <laughs> what a joy this weekend has been for me to be with you, dear folks. Um, you know, you need to know there's a group of guys back in Calgary that are praying for you and for me for this time. Our men's prayer meeting, our elders are praying for you. We prayed for us on Friday and uh, Thursday. Um, and my, my prayer and my desire is that when an opportunity like this, I always consider preaching of the word a daunting joy. Um, my heart's desire is that I would be, by God's grace, able to give. But this has been a receiving few days for me. Um, you've already had two sermons. Like, why do you need another one? <laughs> well, don't worry. I'm not going to. I'm going to preach. <laughs> and it's uh, so thank you, Riverwood. You are a blessing. And I, my, you will be in my prayers and my thoughts, and we are praying, I'm praying this is going to be a, a long friendship with you, dear folks. I'm delighted to be able to jump into the series that you've been going through called The Story. Um, when I first was, when Todd first connected with me and said, we're going through a book called The Story, I thought, why don't they preach the Bible? <laughs> Discovered that it is the Bible, that the story is the Bible, but it's in chronological order been arranged chronologically and with a little bit of commentaries here. It's a great, great study. And today, it's my privilege to lead us through some thoughts on the chapter, chapter 23, if you're following along, starting around page 318, and it's entitled, Jesus Begins His Ministry. Now, if we were the church in Chad, Africa, where I was born, we would go through the whole honking chapter. Passage by passage, because how dare I think that you would be satisfied with anything less than a two and a half or three hour sermon? You think I'm joking. <laughs> but since Winnipeg is quite a bit away from Chad in more ways than one, we'll do the Canadian thing. 36.24 minutes, <laughs> approximately. There's one, chap one portion in this chapter that I really want us to set up camp and look at, but it would be very important for us just to take a whirlwind tour of those scenarios that lead up to it. 
So I need to warn you for the first few minutes, we're going to be traveling at warp speed and taking a 30,000 foot survey of the lay of the land. And then we're going to come down and land in one of my very favorite chapters, portions in the New Testament. So you ready? Here we go. Love it. Keep talking to me too. I'm a teacher. You know, I get talked back to all the time. <laughs> I'm also a parent of four. <laughs> Jesus entering into public ministry is hardly anything but glitzy or glamorous. I, I mean, consider his birth. Born in a stable, but not even in a house. The only thing we know about his childhood, Luke records when he was about 12, he goes to the temple and he's tangling with the PhDs. Now his cousin John the Baptist is out in the wilderness. Now there's an interesting dude. Eats locusts and wild honey. Wears camel hair. But he's preaching a message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people are coming out to him. Thousands of people are coming to him from Jerusalem and Judea to be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. Enter Jesus. He comes to John and says, you need to baptize me. John says, wait, no. I need to be baptized by you. To which Jesus says, no, it is proper for us to do this to fulfill all of righteousness. Folks, Jesus came to be one of us. He was one of us. Jesus is baptized by John. He comes up out of the water. The heavens open and the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus in the form of a dove. And a voice comes from heaven from God the Father says, This is my son. And I love him. My beloved son. With him I am well pleased. Then it says immediately, the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, according to one gospel, said, led him out into the wilderness. Mark says, the Spirit drove him out into the wilderness. For what purpose? To be tested for 40 days by the devil. Now, I, I want to ask Jesus when I see him in glory, I have a problem with this, because later didn't you teach us to pray, Lord, lead us not where? And, but deliver us from... Whoa. So Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit into the presence of evil. And we know of three major temptations that the enemy tried to use to derail Jesus from his purpose, from his mission. He used pride. He used taking things into your own hands, supplying your own needs, and he used worshiping the wrong things. See, Max Licato when said, the fact that God demands that we worship him does not indicate that God's got an ego problem. It's because God knows that if we worship anything smaller than him, we're going to be disappointed. Absolutely. So what does Satan use to derail you? Your job? Money? Relationship? Addiction, I'm going to talk about that. You know, I teach millennials, and lay off the millennials. I love the millennials. <laughs> By the way, if you got something bad to say about them, who raised them? I'm just... <laughs> I'm just saying... You know, I think one of the biggest distractions from, that I see is that great big vortex, big black hole called social media. You know, we've had, we've had MySpace, we've got Twitter, we've got Facebook. It seems to me they've been smart just to combine them all into one and call it my twit face. Yeah. Amen. I have 400 twits. <laughs> it's 
So we check our likes, we get sucked into that, we get addicted to that. Well, Jesus overcame Satan's three attempts to derail him. How did he overcome him? Three words. It is written. How did Jesus overcome Satan? He came over, overcame Satan exactly the same way you and I can overcome him, the word of God. The word of God. Come into the second chapter of John and we find Jesus performing a miracle. He saved a host of a wedding from, in that culture, a devastatingly embarrassing running out of wine. That was catastrophic. He takes these big jugs, 20, 30 gallons, fills them up with water, tells the servant, take it to the host of the feast, and it's the best wine he has ever tasted. Now, don't take that to mean that Jesus is all for getting drunk on really good wine. He was saving a friend from embarrassment. And after that, we read in Scripture says, what Jesus did here in Canaan of Galilee was the first of the signs through which, listen, he revealed his glory. And his disciples believed in him. Come to chapter 3. Guy comes to Jesus at night named Nick. Well, Nicodemus. Let's call him Nick. Part of the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court of the Jewish people. And he comes and he makes a statement. The statement is this. Rabbi, we know you must be from God because nobody could do the signs you are doing, the things you're doing, unless they were from God. To which Jesus, I would have thought, would have said something like, well, thank you very much. Glad you realized that. But he doesn't. He says this. Nobody can enter the kingdom of God unless you are born again. Now, Nicodemus has got some problems with that. And he said, oh, wait a second. How... I mean, I can't crawl. You mean I'm supposed to? I can't get back. I, how did? What was Jesus saying? Well, let me ask you this: How many of you had something directly to do with your own birth? Like, did you decide the day? Did you time the contractions? Did you send an email to your family? Hey, guys, I'm coming out today. You had nothing to do with your first birth. You couldn't make your first birth happen. And Jesus said, you can't do it with your second birth either. You can't make it happen. Chapter 4, John, we find Jesus having a conversation with a woman. Scandalous conversation on two accounts. She was a Samaritan. Jews don't talk to Samaritans. And she was a woman. And men don't talk to women in public like that. And he, tried, he did both. Confronts her with her lifestyle. There's a portion in this passage found in John chapter 4. Uh, this is just a footnote. It's free. <laughs> My dad married a couple. First time for both of them, they were in their 50s. They got married. And the groom wanted to give his bride a Bible. So he gave her a Bible, and he wanted to write a scripture verse in the front of the Bible. So he wrote in there... What he thought he was writing was 1 John 4.18, which says, perfect love casts out, there is no love, fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. Minor detail, he forgot to put 1 John and just wrote John 4.18, which says, and I quote, you have had five husbands, <laughs> and the one you now have is not your husband. True story. Check your references. <laughs> Jesus confronts this dear lady with the lifestyle she's living, and she goes back into the village and says, you've got to come and meet this guy. He told me everything I did. And you know what? He didn't condemn me. And so the village comes out, and they said at the end, yeah, you know, we believe now, not just because of what you said, but we've heard him. And we believe. Jesus and his disciples go on to Capernaum. Jesus is teaching in the synagogue. A demonized man, he's got demons in him, comes there. And Jesus immediately tells the demons to shut up and to come out of him. And again, we find this phrase that is repeated several times throughout the Gospels. And the people were amazed. They go to Simon Peter's house. His mother-in-law is sick. Really sick, got a fever, Jesus heals her, she gets up and serves them. And that night, it says, the whole town, the whole town showed up 
at the door and he healed them all. He healed them of sickness, of all diseases. Healed them of demon influence. The whole town. Jesus tries to get away. Gets up early while it's still dark. Goes to a quiet place to pray. And the disciples come and find him. Jesus, they said. Rabbi, everybody's looking for you. Right, Jesus said about that. Let's go to the other villages. I want to go to the next villages because, he said, let's go to some other villages so I can preach there. That is why I have come. No, I, Jesus, I thought you came to die on the cross. Yes, he did. But before the cross, he came to preach the word. He came to preach the word. A leper comes and kneels in front of Jesus he says, if you're willing, you can make me whole. You can make me clean. And Jesus says, I'm willing. And he heals him. And he touches him. You don't, you don't touch a leper. But Jesus did. See, Jesus did a lot of things he should not have do. Now we come to my favorite passage. Need a break? Are you ready to keep going? Let's keep going. Keep going. <laughs> a preacher loves to hear that. Keep going. <laughs> what he doesn't want to hear is, you stop. So we come to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2 is a marvelous account of where Jesus heals a paralytic man. And it goes something like this. A few days later, Jesus again entered Capernaum. And the people heard that he'd come home. They gathered in such numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And some men came bringing to him a paralyzed, a paralytic carried by four of them. And since they could not get him to Jesus, because of the crowd, they made a hole, an opening in the roof by digging a hole and then letting the mat down. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, son, son, your sins are forgiven. Mark says, now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's, he's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Mark says, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. So he said to them, morons, well, it doesn't say that there, but he thought that, I'm sure. Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to a man, the man, the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, get up, take your mat, and go home on your own steam, by your own strength. He says he got up, picked up his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. Walked out. How did he get there? He was carried in. He met Jesus, and he walked out. Then we read this. This amazed everybody. And they said, we've never seen anything like this. The word of the Lord. Wouldn't it be something, folks, if any time and every time people came to us as the church, they were moved to say, this is amazing. I have never seen anything like this. Hey, this was amazing. These stories were amazing. And you tell me there's no God. Well, why are we here as the church? Jesus said, I'm going to build my church, and I'm going to build it in such a way that the gates of hell don't stand a chance. It seems to me at times that we equate the gates of hell with culture, with the world out there. 
So are we here to resist culture? Are we here to overcome culture? Are we here to berate culture? Are we here to penetrate culture? Or are we here to redeem culture? Or are we here fundamentally and primarily and almost exclusively to reach lost souls? Or are we here fundamentally and primarily to look after widows and orphans, to feed the hungry and to give shelter to the homeless, to give them relief, give relief to the oppressed? Or are we just to be salt and light? What does that mean? Well, listen to Dennis's message from last week because he did a masterful job on what it meant to be, how light came into darkness and what we're supposed to do with that. Love it, Dennis. Why are we here? What is the essence of our mission? I think the best way we can understand the answer to that question, why we're here as a church, is to look at the one who's building the church, that is Jesus. So, two questions, quickly. Now, you know when a preacher says quickly, he's lying. <laughs> we call it hyperbole in the pulpit. Out there it's called, you're fibbing. First question, what do we learn from the life of Jesus? Well, what was he doing as this scenario opens up? Remember, it said, they gathered in such numbers that there was, there was no room left outside, even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. It makes me nervous at times, folks, that even within this broad community of what we call evangelicalism, there's a drift away from confidence in, trust in, commitment to the word of God. And I will tell you this. Jesus' ministry was centered, was rooted in the Word of God. We move away from the Word of God, the Scriptures, as God's authoritative Word. We have no message because we have no gospel. The Scriptures talk about Christ. They exalt Him. That is what our world needs. You go back to chapter 1, verse 35 of Mark chapter, uh, Mark's gospel, and there's a passage we already alluded to, and he said to them, let's go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is what I came out. That is why I've come. I'm blessed. I read your statement of faith. I want to make sure I'm not coming to some weird group, you know. Have you read your statement of faith? You, should, you know, you've got a portion in your statement of faith that's called the Bible, and this is what it says. And I quote, The Old and New Testament, Testaments, inerrant as originally given, were verbally inspired by God and are a complete revelation of His will for the salvation of people. They constitute the divine and only rule of Christian faith and practice. Say to my fellow preachers, if you're not preaching the world, then do the world and the church a favor and shut up. <laughs> Save your breath for cooling your soup. Because <laughs> you have nothing to say if we're not preaching God's word. It is his word that Jesus, it was the word of God that Jesus' ministry was built on. So, Jesus is teaching. He's engaged in this really important ministry. Can, now, can you put yourself in this just using your imagination a bit? Jesus is teaching. People pressed right up against him. All of a sudden, dust starts to fall on him, and debris, and straw, and clay. Guys, I'm teaching here. And all of a sudden, this mat starts to float down. And there's a paralyzed guy in the mat. I guarantee you, that mat stunk. And it comes down right in the middle of them. And what does Jesus say to them? He says, here's what he says to them, son. Now, it's interesting. That's a word that's translated elsewhere, child. He was a man. He wasn't belittling him. It was a term of endearment. You know what that says to me about the ministry of Jesus? It says this. Jesus always approached people who had need with compassion. Needy people were never and inconvenience to Jesus. Those friends and that guy were not a rude, did not represent a rude interruption into the important ministry of Jesus. 
Now, some may think it a bit strange that the first thing Jesus says to him, obviously he's there, everybody would know, they might have even known who the guy was, but it was very apparent, painfully apparent, this man was paralyzed. And some would think it may be strange that the very first thing Jesus addresses is not his paralytic condition, but his heart. And he promises him, he blesses him with this word, son, your sins, they're all forgiven. Now, did Jesus know this guy? Like, did he have a history? Did he be embarrassed for anybody to know about? No, I, we don't know. <laughs> Scripture's silent, but I think here's what Jesus was doing. Jesus was underscoring the fact that that man's essential and fundamental need resided outside his physical needs. As important as they were, his fundamental need was his relationship with God. Now, there are a number of potential questions that could grow out of this. Was this man's sickness, his paralytic condition, therefore a direct result of some sin he had committed? It doesn't say that, but I guarantee you that's what the disciples would have thought. Because you come later in John chapter 9, and Jesus and his disciples are going up to the temple to pray, and there's a blind man begging there, a man that they had known who was blind from his birth. And so the disciples, profound, astute theologians that they were, they knew what the, they had to scoop this guy out. They knew why he was blind, apparently. So they asked Jesus, Rabbi, did this guy sin or his parents that he would be born blind? And Jesus says to them, come here, guys, while I punch you in the face. <laughs> Again, you won't find that in the authorized version. But I think he must have felt like that because he says to them, get this. Jesus said, it was not that this man sinned or, this, or his parents, listen, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Okay, now, hokey pick. How does that fit with your theology of suffering? Hmm. Well, we don't know what was going on in this man's heart, but Jesus knew. Jesus knew his heart. He not only knew his physical condition, he knew his heart. And my dear friends, he knows your heart. And he knows mine. You know what? Forgive me. I got to chuckle when I hear people say, just follow your heart. I go, why would I do that? Jeremiah tells me, my heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? Who can understand it? Yeah, just follow your heart? Really? He knows the condition of our hearts, folks. He does. And yet, he has compassion and he loves us. Absolutely, absolutely amazing. See, Jesus did not address this man's sin to shame him. He addressed him to free him. Not to draw attention to his sin, not to shine a light on his sin, not to remind him of his sin, but to free him from his sin. I think one of the dangers is that we tend to get this hierarchy of sins, uh, of needs, you know, the physical needs or spiritual needs. Well, we've got to really be important, concerned about the spiritual needs of people. Take this, care of the spiritual needs and the physical needs will take care of themselves. Well, Jesus didn't operate that way. In fact, folks, Jesus operated in a way that he took care of the whole person, and he's concerned about you and me as whole people. He's not just concerned about your soul. He is concerned about your body. He is concerned about your relationship. He is concerned about us as whole persons. Here's the thing. Have there ever been people who have asked God for healing that weren't healed? Well, yeah. The Apostle Paul, for one, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he had a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what the thorn in the flesh was. So don't try to figure it out. There have been commentators who have, and they've written books. Can't believe it. And they've come up with suggestions. Oh, must have been epilepsy. Oh, no, cataracts. 
Wait, he had bunions. No, it was his mother-in-law. <laughs> we don't know what his thorn in the flesh was, but I tell you what, it must have been painful enough to have Paul beg God. It's a strong word. I implored God three times to remove it. Three times. Might have even been obvious, embarrassingly obvious. And yet God says to him, You know what, Paul, I've got, I love you too much to give you what you ask for all the time. In fact, I've got something better for you than healing right now. It's called my grace. I don't know about you, folks. If I was Paul, that wouldn't make me real happy. <laughs> I wanted healing. One of the hardest things I ever had to do as a pastor was to bury a dear little friend named Jennifer, and she was six. Jennifer took 18 months to die from a malignant brain tumor. And I, the denomination I belong to believes in the fourfold gospel. Christ is our Savior, our Sanctifier, our Healer, and coming King. I believe Jesus heals. He does. Yes, he does. And I asked God to heal Jennifer. And we prayed and we anointed her. And she died. Why? I don't know why, folks. I don't know. I don't have a reason. And don't tell me. Yeah, at her funeral, one of her dad's partners in the law firm came to Christ. There. That's why Jennifer died. Don't, don't say that to me because... What that implies is that the death of Jesus was insufficient for that one guy. And the cross of Christ is enough. I said it is enough. I don't know why Jennifer died. But I know what the grace of God is all about. Hmm. Well, but I tell you this. Nobody who has ever asked God for forgiveness has ever been denied. Not one. Jesus was the demonstration of how far God, willing was, God was willing to go to make this possible by being with us and among the sick. You can't do this kind of ministry from a distance, folks. So what do we learn from Jesus? Jesus. We learn, first of all, that his life and ministry were centered and rooted in the word of God. Never move away from this, Riverwood. Never move away from scripture as our mooring. But secondly, we learn that Jesus related to those who were in need with compassion. They were never an inconvenience. And thirdly, he ministered to them as whole people, the whole person, body, soul, and spirit. Not just one part but all parts. You know what this is? This is a demonstration of what being full of grace and truth looks like. John said it in John chapter 1, verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Hey, listen, church, as us, what does grace and truth look like? When members of the LGBTQ community come to us, what does grace and truth look like when people who are struggling with alcoholism and addiction come to us? What does grace and truth look like? Love. You said it. We love them. That's what Jesus did. Grace and truth is to look like Jesus. It's to look like Christ. Well, Let's learn, secondly, what do we learn from these four friends? Very quickly. They knew what their need of their friend was. They knew him well enough. It doesn't say it explicitly. I've got to say, these guys loved this guy. They, he lo they loved him. And let me tell you this. Dear friends, we will never become and be the people God wants us to be unless we let other people love us and minister to us. You see? And that love for their friend moved them to action. Wonder how many times we might be tempted to walk by friends like that who are on the mat, 
I'm praying for you, bud. I'll pray for you. You're on my prayer list. In fact, I pray for you. You're on my Wednesday prayer list. I'm not, and I don't want to downplay that. I, that's great. I, I, I say Wednesday because I'm on one of my best buddies' Wednesday prayer list. <laughs> I am. He prays for me and my family and all my kids. You're thinking, all oh my kids? How many does a guy have? For kind of Only four. Yeah, he's got four. And four in-laws and two magnificent grandchildren. And I've got pictures if you want to see them after. <laughs> well, these guys, their faith moved them to do some action and they run into an obstacle. It makes me think of, I've often heard it say, well, they didn't prepare me for this in seminary. What do you do with, when, you, when there's no room? How do you get people to Jesus? You become creative and you become strategic. And even if it means rearranging somebody's property. There's no mention of it here, but I have to think the owner of the house must have been standing there. Saying, hey, God, <laughs> who, who's paying for my roof? After the first service, I had a brother come to me and said, I know what happened. Jesus said to the owner of the house, here's my dad's business card. He's a carpenter. <laughs> uh, don't think so. No. Here's the thing. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, the evidence of their faith was in what they did, not what they believed. They believed things, but their belief became active. The evidence of their faith was clearly demonstrated in the actions they took to get their friends into the presence of Jesus. How much are you willing to pay? How much effort, how much embarrassing, inconvenient, strenuous stuff are you willing to do to get those you love into the presence of Jesus? Faith is seen in the example of these guys is an attitude that is expressed in action. It's a belief demonstrated through behavior. It's not just a believed faith. It's a lived out faith. Hey, friends, can I ask you, are, are you one of these kinds of friends? Can, can you think of anybody in your life right now that's on the mat? It's with permission that I tell you um, that I'm the father of an alcoholic. Uh, we just celebrated a year of sobriety in January. Now, here's the thing. He's an amazing guy. In fact, for seven years of his alcoholic journey, he was a pastor. Quietly, shamefully, alone. Alcoholics Anonymous has taught me many things, and all and on, not the least of which is you didn't cause it, you can't control it, and you can't cure it. All I could do, all my wife and I could do, was lay our kid at the feet of Jesus. And he's doing a new thing. Well... What we see in these friends, summarize it, they were completely convinced. They knew what the need was. They knew what the need was. I think sometimes we act as though we know what the need was, but are we listening to the people? Do we know what the need is? One of the most, I think, missing elements of effective evangelism is we act as though we got two mouths and one ear. Have a look in the mirror. We got two ears and one mouth that says we should listen twice as much as we speak. They knew what the need was. 
And they were, that awareness moved them to action. And secondly, they were convinced that Jesus, Jesus could remedy their friend's desperate needs. I have to believe, folks, if we are radically convinced of the needs of people in our lives and equally deeply convinced that Jesus can meet them, we're going to act in a certain way. But thirdly, they were determined to get their friend to Jesus no matter what the challenges were. I think that mat, as I said, probably stunk. It probably had human sweat and human excrement on it. It's where the guy laid all day. They had to get their hands dirty to get their friend to Jesus. They had to get people upset with them. They had to do things you'd never plan on doing. They had to be willing to be made a spectacle of because they loved this guy. They knew Jesus could heal him, and they would do anything to get him there. So why are we here as the church? We're here to be like Jesus. That's what we're here to do. And quite simply, when we look at the example of Jesus, we can't be like him outside the realm of our relationships. The word was made flesh and set up his tent. I like how Eugene Peterson says it. He moved into the neighborhood so we could behold his glory. Christ told us what being full of grace and truth is like. He showed us that he was concerned for whole people. He did not shame them. And those guys showed us that their faith moved them to action. You know, I'm wondering if maybe the person that you are most identified with here today is the guy on the mat. Now, you, you, like a lot of us, you put up a really good front. Nobody would know, just on outward appearances, what the fact that you got here somehow this morning or today, but you're gutted. But there's no way you're going to let people know that because, you see, that would be shameful. You know, the other thing about AA is they don't do shame. <laughs> there's no shame. They don't do shame. I don't think we do it maliciously or intentionally, but I think sometimes as a church we come dangerously close that that's what we're really good at. Um, maybe there are people in your life that are trying to get you to the feet of Jesus because A, they love you, and B, they're convinced that Christ can heal you. He can. He's restoring my boy. And he can do that for anybody. Maybe some of us need to stop pretending that it's all good. There's only two reasons why I think we would. Is that A, it's a pride thing. We don't want people to really know what's going on inside. Or maybe we're, we're convinced that the response is going to be shame. Tut, tut, tut. That's what you get. Sin will always have its consequence. I don't ever remember Jesus saying that. Except to the religious people. He was on the religious people like a heat rash. And he was merciless. <laughs> but to broken people, to the prostitutes to the equivalent of the addicts and the alcoholics. He was called the friend of sinners. <laughs> they meant that as a slam. I think it's the greatest compliment that could be paid to Jesus, and I think that would be the greatest compliment to be paid to you and me as a church. Of all places where broken people can come to receive Healing and be put back together again should it not be with us as the church, folks. Yeah. All right. I've said more than I wanted to say, actually. And the numbers are now red up there, which means, <laughs> dude, you're overtime. <laughs> oh, yeah, yes. 
Well, you know, Todd made the mistake at the end. He said, you know, this is the service, you know, don't, don't worry about time. I said, you never tell a preacher that. Like, seriously. <laughs> Let me end with these two questions. My pastor back home, I love my pastor, as I know you love yours. He always asks me these two questions, and it's simply this. Is God saying something to you today, friend? What's God saying to you? And if he is, what are you going to do about it? You know, maybe for some today, it means being willing to say, I'm on the mat, and I need help. I love what you do here. There's always going to be a prayer team available here at the end of the service. And if God is saying something to you, I would beg you, don't leave here without receiving what God wants to give you, wholeness, himself. Let me pray, and then Todd will come and lead us to our conclusion. Dear Jesus, blessed Jesus, I thank you for this time we've had together. I thank you that you are present here with us by your Holy Spirit. I thank you for the power and gift of your word. And I thank you that you desire more than anything for us to be whole. Would you, by your Holy Spirit, do only what you can do? Would you bring down, would you bind the powers of Satan and darkness in the name of Christ and release those who need freedom into the joy of your grace? And I pray this so that in, fi in spite of us and through us, you will be made large and we'll be blessed because we pray by your grace for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, folks. Yeah, thank you. You know, if I needed to uh, put a title on that message, I don't know that you did, uh, it would be, you don't have what it takes. You don't have what it takes to save yourself. If you're carrying the mat for somebody else, you don't have what it takes to heal them and fix them. And if you're on the mat, you don't have what it takes to fix your own life. We all need Jesus. And uh, so at the Warehouse Fire Hall, uh, Churchill, wherever you are, uh, if you are identifying with any of those people, I really encourage you to do what Dr. Bill said, which is access someone else uh, to pray. Maybe you need to pray for the person on the mat. Maybe we need to intercede together. Uh, maybe you are that person. And uh, we're going to take some time. In fact, I'm going to ask Bill, instead of going to the door, uh, if you just join us on prayer team. And if you'd like to talk with Bill or um, share your story or pray with him, uh, he'll be here as well as Carolyn and I and the, the rest of the prayer team. So I'm going to release the rest of the sites. Have yourself a fantastic week.